Good morning, church. God is good. All the time. Friends, welcome to worship here this morning with Kalamazoo First United Methodist Church. Welcome to you who are in the sanctuary. Welcome to, welcome to you who are worshiping from home today. It is good to be together. I'm Pastor Matt Weiler, and our lead pastor, Julie Klein, is sitting here in the front row. And on behalf of ourselves and the worship leadership today, we welcome you here and we pray that today you know that you are loved. We pray that you know that you are accepted for all of who you are in this place. We pray that on this Transfiguration Sunday, you see and know and experience the glory of God and feel empowered to take that glory out into the world where we will be sent. Today, as we worship and we celebrate the goodness and the glory of God, we do so mindful of the violence that's happening in our world. And so I just want to acknowledge this and name that later in worship, through prayers and through the peace of Christ, we will take a moment to acknowledge and to pray for the people of, of Ukraine. And I just wanted to acknowledge that because as we enter into this time of worship, uh, we enter into it with, with celebration and praise, right? And we, and we hold the complexity of these two things together. But with that, with praise and grief on our hearts, all of these things at the same time, dancing together, I invite you to stand and join as we share our call to worship together. Beyond our busy schedules, above the cold winter floor, there is a glory rising born of heaven and reaching out to each one of us, a light that shines through the clouds, an invitation seeking all who we are that transfigures the world, that transforms darkness into hope, that brings life from a cross where old life ends and new life is born. In glory, Jesus meets us here, raising us from the depths of valley to the height of the mountain, carrying the weight of our humanity to the heights of heaven's glory. Let us worship from the mountain and hear again. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. As we sing our opening hymn this morning, we invite all of the children that are here with us in the congregation to go to the back and join Miss Julia as she brings in the light of Christ.
Once there was someone who said such amazing things and did such wonderful things that people began to follow them. But the people didn't know who this person was. So one day, the people just had to ask them. And Jesus said, I am the light. And the congregation can sit if you want to. <laughs> and then kids, do you want to watch Pastor Julie? She's lighting the light of Christ behind you. Let us enjoy the light. Yeah. And children at home and children here in the sanctuary with us today, can you please, just the children, repeat after me? So can you repeat after me? Okay, so we say, we light these candles as a reminder that Jesus is always with us. Thank you. Now, before we say our children's blessings, I want to show everyone that today we have a rosebud on the altar. And the rosebud means that we get to celebrate the birth of a new baby. So February 7th, I believe, Eleanor Jean was born to Bryce and Allison. And Eleanor Jean, there's a picture of her on the screens. She's such a cute little baby. She is the great granddaughter of Liza and Keen Wolf. So that is a wonderful, wonderful celebration. Now if the congregation would please join me in blessing our children here with us today and the children that are in their homes joining us virtually. Please say this with me. May God bless you and be with you. God loves you. So do we. Thank you. Amen. Let us be in prayer. O oh Lord, you call us to go to the mountaintop with you, and we follow, not quite sure of what is to happen, but we like mountaintops. We like the view from up here. We like mountaintop experiences. Lord, sometimes we need mountaintop experiences with you when our days are dark and dreary, when our hearts are heavy, when the valleys seem more depressing than ever. Lord, may this mountaintop experience fill our hearts with your light. May we be filled with your love. May we be filled with hope, your hope. Lord, just as Moses and your disciples were changed by their experiences, we too are changed and transformed into the image of Christ by your mercy. Lord, May we have unveiled faces that reflect your love, your hope, and your light. Amen. As we light this peace candle today, many of you know that we've been lighting a peace candle for years and years and years. We've made our way through multiple of these very large candles praying for peace. And yet, this morning... We also know that it is that much more important, that much more relevant that we pray for peace and that we allow peace to begin with us. So as we light this candle, I invite you to put your hand on your heart, close your eyes, whatever it is that will put you into a prayerful place so that for a moment of silence we may send love
compassion, peace, and understanding to all who are in Ukraine and for all who suffer under violence and oppression. Let us send this peace out into the world. As the disciples experienced Jesus' transfiguration, they didn't understand it. It didn't make sense. And yet they knew that they were in the presence of glory. They knew they were in the presence of light and that nothing could contain this light. And so on this morning then, let us remember that that light was never meant to be left up on the mountaintop. It was meant to blaze throughout the whole land. May this be the peace that we know and that happens in all lands. May the light shine. Would you all please stand here in the sanctuary, here in your own homes, stand and pass the peace with those that are around you or even afar. Pass the peace.
in the Gospel of Luke. The transfiguration is the pivotal moment in the story as the disciples' journey with Jesus increases in intensity. And Jesus' trajectory turns decidedly the way of Jerusalem where he will meet the cross. This vignette, Jesus being ministered to by Moses and Elijah while Peter and John and James are, observe, are observing, tells us and the disciples a great deal about Jesus. With these two great predecessors on either side, Moses the giver of the law and Elijah the greatest of all the prophets, Jesus is affirmed as the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets. Therefore, God instructs the onlooking disciples to listen up because this is my chosen one, my son. The voice of God on the mountain echoes through time and eternity, now to, <clears throat> now to the ears in worship, calling us to be attentive to the words and instruction of God's chosen. If it's comfortable for you to stand, let us stand for the reading <clears throat> of the gospel. Now about eight days after these sayings, <clears throat> Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. <clears throat> Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his de departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. But since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. This is what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. It's starting to fill up a little bit in here. God is good all the time. Let's pray. Spirit of God, come and grow our faith, deepen our hope, strengthen our love, and water within each of us a greater desire to be in relationship with each other and with you so that we might be your faithful friends. It's in Christ's name we all say together, amen. Do you know that Lent begins on Wednesday? <laughs> Julie and I kind of had a freak out moment about that last week when we realized that. But this is why we're reading the Transfiguration story today, because it's that threshold between ordinary time and Lent. And in Luke's gospel, the Transfiguration is a turning point in the narrative. Once Jesus comes down from this mountain, his eyes are set on Jerusalem. And so we read this text every Sunday, with every year on this Sunday, with the intention of turning our own eyes towards Jerusalem with the disciples. Beginning on Wednesday with the ashes, we'll journey with Jesus to a cross in Jerusalem, and along the way we'll contemplate our own mortality and our fragility and our sinfulness and our brokenness. We'll make confession and we will repent. It's the gritty part of the Christian season, of the Christian year. But today, before all of that, we're up on the mountain with Jesus. And while we're up here, I encourage you to not get too caught up in the details of it all, but instead just let it stoke your imaginations and perhaps draw you more intimately and more and deeply into relationship with the God who invited you up here in the first place. This is a text that can be as confusing for us to read as it must have been for the disciples to experience. I'll even admit that my first couple of years in ministry, I just kind of pretended there wasn't a Transfiguration Sunday. I didn't know what to do with it. 
But I've learned a helpful way to read and interpret scripture is to ask three questions of the text. One, what is this telling me about God? Two, what is this story telling us about ourselves? And three, what is this telling us about our relationship with God? It's a method that I found helps us approach our interpretations less as fact-finding missions and more as truth-revealing. And when we worry about the facts of a story, we get caught up wondering exactly what it meant that Jesus was found suddenly glowing like a light bulb and whether Moses and Elijah were actually there or if it was some kind of a vision. Trying to understand the facts of Scripture can sometimes have us playing kind of mental gymnastics with ourselves and perhaps filling our heads with a great deal of semi-useful information. Seeking the truth of Scripture moves it from an academic exercise to a spiritual movement. Now I know what you're thinking. My truth might be different from your truth. First UMC's truth and interpretation of what truth is is going to be different from First Baptist down the road. So how can anyone know the actual truth of the story? Sometimes it's just a risk that we have to take. And I think that these three questions help us to take that risk with some integrity. And if at the end of the day you're doubtful, just take my truth. That's the one. (laughs) So let's try it out. What is this story about transfiguration telling us about God? Specifically, what is it telling us about Jesus? From my perspective, it's telling us three things. The first is that we cannot know Jesus apart from the law and the prophets. Up on that mountain with Jesus, there appeared Moses on one side and Elijah on the other. Who each of these men were is important. Moses was the great liberator of the Hebrew people, and he was the one that handed the law down to them, the Ten Commandments. And this act made them a newly liberated people, They had no identity. Now they had identity. They were wandering, and now they were bound to God. They had identity, and they had purpose. And it was their path from wilderness wandering to promised land. And everything Jesus said and did was his interpretation of this law. And so to know Jesus is to know God's law represented fully by Moses who stood with him on that mountain. Also with Jesus was Elijah. Of all the prophets, Elijah was the greatest. Elijah raised the dead, and as the story goes, he never even died himself. Rather, he was carried away into the heavens by a chariot of fire. Is it true? Is that a true story? Well, perhaps it's true that true prophets never die. Their words and their legacy only grow more powerful over time. Think about Martin Luther King Jr. Was he shot and killed horrifically on a balcony in Memphis on April 4th, 1968? Yes, fact. Does he yet live? Yes, truth. Has he stood beside and ministered to the brave champions of civil rights in the last 50 years since that date? I believe so, truth. Back to Elijah. He was the greatest of prophets believed to never die, and so to this day the Jewish practice is to leave a seat at the table for Elijah, just in case. The role of the prophets was to remind a people when they forgot their name who they were. And when they strayed, it was to remind them that they were loved by God and what it meant for them to be God's love in the world. And so to understand Jesus is to understand the voice of the prophets. In all this, we learn that Jesus is the fulfillment of all the law and the prophets And in this, he is glorified. A second thing that we can learn about Jesus from this story is how intimately he was connected to the Holy Spirit and to God whom he called Father. In Jesus' moment of glory, we are given a glimpse along with the disciples into this Trinitarian relationship. Jesus went up to the mountain so he could pray, and surely it was the Holy Spirit at work. Surely it was the Holy Spirit at work when his appearance changed and his clothes became dazzling. Surely the Holy Spirit was at work resurrecting Moses and Elijah to be by his side. And then there was God's voice from the cloud. God's words in that moment were both instructional to the disciples and they were loving affirmation for Jesus. They were words of affirmation of the identity that was given to him in his baptism. This is my son, my chosen, listen to him. From this moment on, Jesus' trajectory would be towards Jerusalem and the cross of his crucifixion. And so surely he would carry the Father's words with him. You are my child, my beloved. 
Surely as the disciples followed him, even though they would abandon him, they would remember, surely this is God's chosen. From this we learn something about the intimate and loving Trinitarian relationship entered into through prayer. And perhaps we too, like the disciples on that mountain, can enter into the intimacy of that relationship in prayer. A third thing we learn about Jesus, and this is admittedly difficult, is that his mission at this point was one of suffering, and he was decidedly moving towards his suffering, and he needed to be encouraged. Jesus, whom we think of as the minister to us, needed to be ministered to. Enter Moses and Elijah on the mountain, speaking with him about these things. When I imagine this encounter, I don't imagine a casual conversation here. Hey, so you're heading towards Jerusalem. I wonder what the weather is going to be like. Instead, I imagine this moment of grief and empathy, place sharing. While neither Moses nor Elijah were crucified, they did suffer for the sake of God's mission in their life. And so I imagine them assuring Jesus that his death would not be his end, that he would rise in victory, and that they would be with him the whole way. I imagine them saying to Jesus, remember who you are and whose you are. Remember you are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. I imagine it being this incredibly intimate and pastoral moment. In this, we learn that Jesus knew exactly where he was heading, that he anticipated the cross that was awaiting him. In this, we learn that even Jesus needed his friends to stay with him in his suffering. It's an important thing for us to remember come Holy Week. It's easy for us and tempting for us to just skip Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday and jump right to Easter, but those services are not about us. Those services are about us staying with Jesus through his suffering because the rest of the year he walks with us through ours. There are likely a hundred more things we can learn about Jesus in this transfiguration, but now I want to move to what we might learn about ourselves. When we read the Bible, we can learn a great deal about ourselves and about our relationship with God through the stories of the people. In this case, we can learn a great deal about ourselves through Peter and James and John's experience. To begin with, we learn that we are invited into this Trinitarian relationship. When we look at the story, we see that these three were invited by Jesus to come along with him up the mountain. Why he chose those three, who knows? Who knows? There's all kinds of speculation, but for now we are concerned with what we learn. That Jesus invited them and therefore Jesus invites us into this relationship, invites us into this Trinitarian experience. This means that God is the initiator of all love and all grace. It reminds me of something I once heard that I will never forget, that we cannot grasp God. We can only be grasped by God. We are invited along with the disciples into this relationship. Secondly, we learn that, it is in, that it's God's intention for us to see God's glory here in the church. Okay, I'm biased because I'm a preacher, but I stand by this. Even in all of its flaws and its messiness, from our fights over the color of the carpet to the ways that we have dragged our feet on racial justice and inclusion and all the simple ways that we've just been bad Christians and given Jesus a bad name, the church is still God's intentionally chosen place to reveal God's glory. Yes, we can find the glory of God in places outside of the church. Sure, we can find God's glory out upon our own mountaintops. Yes, I saw the glory of God with the birth of each of my children. I've seen God's glory as I have stood on actual mountaintops. I can tell you a thousand times when I've experienced the the glory of God alone. Perhaps you can rattle off your own moments. Maybe it was a breathtaking sunset, an unexpected miracle, sharing a meal at Yana, distributing cell phones, delivering a meal to a homebound member. It's not that God's glory is limited to the church. Rather, God chooses to gather a scattered and broken and sin-prone people that together we might see and then go proclaim this glory. It's God's intention that the church see God's glory when we gather. Have you seen the glory of God in our worship? Third, we like the disciples prefer to stay on the mountain, basking in the glory. But Jesus also needs us in the valley. 
I've heard countless sermons over the years in which the preacher throws these poor disciples under the bus and paints them as stupid and bumbling guys who just don't get it simply because they wanted to build shelters on that mountain. But I don't blame them one bit. Do you know what was waiting for them in the valley? There was a man whose son was being tortured by a demon. There was a cross for Jesus' crucifixion. It was violent and it was filled with sickness and sadness and injustice. And on the mountaintop, there was Israel's greatest liberator and greatest prophet and an illuminated Jesus. Who would want to come down from that? But that's exactly where Jesus needed them, in the valley. Jesus needed them to breathe in the glory and then breathe it out in the valley. Jesus needs us to breathe in the glory we feel and see and know on the mountain and then carry it into the trenches. A final thing I would offer that we can learn about ourselves and about our relationship with God is that there are some things that only make sense after Easter. At the end of the story, Luke tells us that they kept silent in those days and that they told no one of any of the things that they had seen, which is a really ominous statement to make. Had you been up on that mountain, would you have not posted it on your Facebook or Instagram or whatever page immediately? But then instantly you would have regretted it. Instantly, because no one would have believed it and would have just run you over. It would have been terribly frustrating. No one would have understood. And the truth is, if we are honest, we can barely understand the glory of God ourselves. But we do know the end of the story. We know that in Jerusalem, Jesus was crucified and three days later resurrected. And the resurrection gives meaning to the rest of the story. The disciples, having not yet known the truth of the resurrection, couldn't make sense of any of it. They couldn't make sense of the healing and the teaching and the business about taking up their crosses. They couldn't make sense of Elijah and Moses on the mountain with Jesus. They could not make sense of Jesus and his glory or the voice of God coming from the clouds. All they knew was what they saw. But before the resurrection, they couldn't make sense of any of it. And so they kept silent. But eventually they broke the silence or we wouldn't know the story. I can just imagine the remaining disciples one day sitting down to a cup of coffee with Luke as he was getting ready to write this gospel. And he was asking them to tell all the stories that they could remember about Jesus so he could put it down in his book. Well, there was the day when he first called all of us. We were walking along the beach. Then there was that time when he touched and he healed that leper. And then, hey, do you remember when he called Levi? We thought he was out of his mind. He was that dirty, rotten tax collector back in those days. Then there was that time in the synagogue when he invited a man with a withered hand to come front and center. There was the time when he angered all of the rich folks in town when he preached the Sermon on the Mount. And then he angered everyone when he talked about loving our enemies. Things really began to take a turn that one day when Jesus and Peter got into it. You remember that? When he, when he told us that, if we were gonna, that, that he was going to suffer and die? Peter didn't like that. And then he said, all of us who follow him very, white, very might well suffer and die ourselves. Peter was outright angry with Jesus that day. And then it was after those things. It was after those statements that he made that he went and invited Peter and John and James up on the mountain. And then the disciples look over to Peter and James and John and they said, well, you never really did say what happened up there. What happened? And the three of them looked at one another and almost in unison kind of went, oh, that's what it was about. It never made sense, so we didn't really know what to say. But now that he's resurrected, it means that he really was God's beloved. It means that he really was God's chosen one. It means that everything he did and said was true and eternal. And it means that it's worth dropping everything to follow. Sometimes I would prefer to stay on the mountain wrapped in the cloud of God's glory, but I can't. We cannot. There's a road before us and it goes to Jerusalem where there is a cross. And so we can't stay on the mountain for too much longer. We've got just a few more days and then we have to come down and begin our journey with Jesus to the cross. But for now, for this moment, 
Let's stay in the glory. Because if we've learned anything, it's this. That God has invited us into the glory to remind us who we are. So that we can breathe it in and then breathe it out in the valleys. But for now, let's just stay on the mountain for a few more days. In the glory, in the peace, let us pray. God of all people, we pray for peace today and every day, especially for the people of Ukraine and for the people of Russia who are oppressed. May your peace be with all struggling with mental illness, with all who face violence, domestic violence, persecution, and war. We ask that your spirit abides with Keegan, Christina, Anna, and for all who find themselves lost and lonely. Send your spirit of wisdom upon our world leaders. May the decisions they make be in the interest of all Earth's citizens. Send your spirit of compassion upon those who bear arms. May they turn instead to reconciliation and dialogue. Send your spirit of healing upon those who are injured. May they know your touch through the hands of those who care for them. May your spirit abide with Don and Harriet, Lana, the Hyde family, the Ugin family, the Scusa family, Mary Lou, Kathy, John and Ann, Ken, Finn, Vicki, Sarah and Tyler, and all who are in need of your healing. 
Send your spirit of welcome upon those who are killed in this act of war. May they know the embrace of your love. Send your spirit of consolation on those who have lost loved ones. May they know your comfort in your promise that one day they will see them again. Send your spirit of protection on those who have lost their homes. May they find shelter and security. Send your spirit, O oh God, of hospitality upon all nations. May they welcome refugees into their midst. Send your spirit of hope unto us. and on to your world. May we live into your vision of a future of justice and peace as we resist evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. May your spirit give confidence to a grandson who is undertaking new training. We ask for courage for Ken and continued healing for loved ones. Lord, in your mercy, we ask you to hear, hold, and accept our prayers and our hearts. Hear all the unspoken prayers that we have yet to understand how to put into words. And then in your spirit, in your love, in your blazing glory, Make us into your prayers. As we pray together this prayer that Jesus taught his disciples so long ago and yet is so deeply holy. Let us pray. Our God, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This weekend, I remembered with gratitude that we are part of a connectional church, which means we are the church all across the world, in all places, at all times. And so as we give of our offering today, I would just remind you that we are a connectional church. Our church is at work across the world. Our church is at work here in this community, seeking peace, seeking hope, Attempting to be a blazing light of hope. So as you give your gifts, trust that indeed the light of this ministry, the light of our collective ministry, goes out into the valleys. You may give of your gifts with a basket outside the doors. You may give online. You may text your giving. But in this time, as we listen to sacred music, let us offer our hearts to God.
Let us join together in this prayer of dedication. O God, whose glory shines from mountains, fills valleys, and illuminates our worship, we offer these gifts, asking you to bless and multiply them, that your glory may shine from these walls and fill our city with your love and justice. Amen. So Pastor Matt is correct in that Lent did kind of sneak up on us this year, and so much so that uh, we forgot to put an announcement in the bulletin that we will have an Ash Wednesday worship service. So please come and join us at 7 p.m. this Wednesday, and we will be offering that here in the sanctuary and streamed as well. So we hope that you will join us to mark and begin this very significant journey in our Christian life together. It is important that we repent, that we turn away that from all that is no longer serving God nor ourselves and turn in our walk closer to Christ. 7 p.m. this Wednesday. You will find all kinds of other ways to be engaged in our shared life as well. A couple of months ago, we met and had many house meetings, and I want you to look at just what's happening and what is going on as far as that response to those house meetings that say, we want more opportunities to join together in small groups, to be in relationship with one another. And I'm not going to go through the details of them all. I'm just going to tell you that there's two classes offered today. One is telling our stories offered right after worship at 11... Um, 11 o'clock in the parlor with uh, Jennifer and Jackie. And then the Gifts of Imperfection happen on Zoom at 4.30. There's going to be a new small group happening beginning this Thursday with Katie McGinnis. And then we'll also be doing Lenten book um, studies as well. And then, of course, we are gearing up for that big deal weekend. I hope you've been reading about it. I hope you are getting excited about it. I was talking to one of the persons that has been working more closely with the facilitators this week, and she was telling me even more, and I I got very excited about what is going to be happening on that weekend. So I hope that you will go to our website and sign up for that big deal weekend and that you will also then sign up for a small group as well. So now, yes, let's rise if you are able in mind and body and spirit and let us sing ourselves into this world because our world needs a song.
just real quick before I share the benediction, if you need some more information about those small groups or if you need to pick up a book, I'm happy to meet you out there and help make that happen by the welcome desk right after worship here. But friends, as we go from this place, I invite you to first breathe in deeply and receive the glory of God. And then as you go from this place, to breathe out and to breathe that glory into the world and carry the peace and the love and the grace of Jesus Christ with you. Amen.